Welcome to Cut the Bull, an insightful podcast which addresses the news of the day and the cultural issues plaguing our society. Bringing logic and context to these topics and discussing solutions too real for mainstream pundits. Now, here are your hosts, Charles Love, Shamika Michelle, and Wilfred Riley. Hello and welcome to Cut the Bull. I am Charles Love alongside my co-host Shamika Michelle. Will is not with us this evening. We're going to miss him for this uh, fiery conversation. And our guest this week is Robert Cherry. He is a professor emeritus at Brooklyn College and the author of Why the Jews? How Jewish Values Transform 20th Century American Pop Culture, among other things. But that's going to be key to the conversation. And I would say an American Jew is like, I've never labeled anybody, any of the guests before, but it may be important for this conversation because we wanted to bring Robert on to have conversations about what was at the time, Kanye, and then turned into Kanye and Kyrie, was turned into Dave Chappelle, was turned into, you know, everyone now, just the, the, the nature of what is con considered a growing strand of anti-Semitism, or particularly what Shamika and I want to address is the relationship between the, the Jewish community and Black. So, uh, Robert, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. Well, it's great to have you. You, you and I have had several conversations. I was just yes. talking about when you were on the show, how uh, I got probably laughed louder on air than I ever did with uh, something you said. I'm so I was going to laugh again when you bring it up here. But is there something to it? I, I, I ask because um, we see a lot of the comments and reaction to both Kanye and Kyrie and all the others. And I usually, you know, especially when it's politics, stay on the side, just watch people argue and 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 maybe say nothing or just say something small. But I watch this thing happen and I just think that's such a large part of the conversation that's not being had. So I guess I wanted to start off by you telling us what your uh, views of the whole kerfuffle is. You don't have to take any one of them specifically, we'll get into those, but just in general from, from how it started to where we are now and, and, and what you think of oh, the, how it's reacting. I think it, it raises the issue of how black anti-Semitism or anti-Jewish views, how black anti-Jewish views are really much different than, e than either the left wing, which is focused on anti-Zionism, or the right wing, which is focused on Jewish power, broadly speaking, mm -hmm. whether it's banking, political. Uh, that's not what either Kanye or Kyrie or Dave Chappelle, they weren't about any of those things because it's really about Jews have been intertwined with black people for the last hundred and more years. They're interacting with them in communities as their shopkeepers, as their landlords, as the teachers in their schools. They're interacting with them in the what I wrote about in the music industry. And, you know, my position is that in the music industry, and I'll get into it in some degree, Jews were really responsible for bringing black music from the periphery to the center of American pop culture. That they played a very unique and generally positive role. I mean, they're warts, they're certainly are warts. But again, it's, it's this interaction that Jews have with blacks, it's not it's, you know, the left wingers who are concerned about anti-Zionism, they don't have any interaction with Jews. They, they have an idea that they're against. The right wing race, you know, anti-Semites, they don't have any relationship with Jews. They have this vision of Jewish power and so on. But with black people, it's those relationships that create tensions and can often lead to, you know, adverse views 
where negativity is too often dominant in the discussion. Wow. Well, I mean, right off the bat, those are great points. I didn't even think about that until you said it. But it's true. It's kind of like the race thing. It's right. Shamika, it's kind of like the people, the the the, the white liberals are going to say, I'm an ally and I'm an anti-racist and I'm going to explain racism to you. But they don't want to live in the neighborhood. They were, you know, it's like the old thing that they say about blacks in the South. It was like, we don't care, you know, how close you get as long as you don't get too uppity. And in the North, they were like, we don't care how uppity you get as long as you don't get too close. The arm <laughs> was really more North than it was South. Right. So now you got these people like, I'm going to speak on behalf of black, but don't let, if they get in the elevator with me, I'm running out screaming. Right. So right. Shemika, let, 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 we're setting the tone. They're sending their kids to private schools. Right. right. So so we're setting the tone generally and we'll get into specifics. But Shamika, just tell me what you think of, you know, what Robert said and what you think of the overall, you know, comments and then responses to uh, the uh, alleged anti-Semitism. So much. Um, I do think that. Well, see, I don't know, because I was raised in the South. Right. And so, like I've said several times, I can't look at somebody and tell they're Jewish. I don't know they're Jewish, even by their last name, by the way they look, unless they're dressed in a Jewish garb that I would I would recognize. I don't know. So, like, I would never have an issue with someone because they're Jewish. I think I would have an issue with them because of some other reason, and then they may end up being Jewish. Mm -hmm. And so I guess my concern is like, not is it possible for me to be anti-Semitic because I'm a Jew, like that's not my stance. My stance is, would it be possible if I don't know you're Jewish? Like, and could I be at risk of being accused of being anti-Semitic because somebody happens to be Jewish and I, I have a problem with them. I think with what's going on right now, that would kind of be not my fear because I'm not afraid of anything, but it's like that would be my issue, I guess, where I might could run into trouble. Now, I did put up a joke earlier today. <laughs> I've been offensive. We go, I don't we know. We'll get to that. I literally got a phone call about your joke. That's a, not, you not a DM. Not a tweet, not a text. I got a phone call. Like, uh, to like, I love Shamika, but what the? And I can. I'm gonna let you explain. I I told them what I thought it was, but I will let you explain the joke. You can do it now, or we can do it later. But I'll let you finish. Yes, and so I, it's it's almost just like with with the climate and after a con, Kanye and and Kyrie and and Dave Chappelle. It's just almost like people are looking to be offended because I grew up on there was a, a white man, black man, Jew man. These, these are things that I didn't know was, was offensive. Like sometimes black people are the butt of the joke, like they're the punchline. And I thought those jokes were just as funny as, you know, if the punchline was on the whites or the Jews and it's just so, I don't know, so much is going on now for me. I feel like almost like I'm supposed to learn who's Jewish. Like I need to figure out what last names fall under that, what physical characteristics fall under that. That's kind of how I feel. And I have a question. Can you actually be a Jew if you don't believe in God? Because I would say no. Samika. But am, am I going too far, Charles? Let's cut the board. <laughs> Go, Go ahead. Go ahead. Let Go me ahead. just say surveys, surveys say that 25% of people who are committed Jews, they practice some of the holidays, mm -hmm. they do a whole range of things, they go to synagogue. 25% of them are atheists because Unlike Christianity, I mean, you have to believe in Jesus, right? You can't be a Christian uh -huh. without believing in Jesus. Uh -huh. But you can be a Jew if you believe in the cultural values and the written word. And uh, and the religion is separate in many ways. Uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. Let me give a, a joke that is the highest order of study in Judaism is the Talmud. 
in the Talmud, they have this story about four Jews getting together to try to figure out how a particular rule works. Three of them say it works this way. The other one says it works another way, the rule. How do you apply it? So the, the one single person says, but God is on my side. And God, he says, God will do this. He throws down a, a bolt of lightning. He does this. He does else. And what the other three say is, I guess it's three to two. So, you know, there's there's a much more complicated view of God in Judaism mm -hmm. than in Christianity. But anyway, that's separate view. But but I want to say something, Shamika. See, this is why it's important to have Shamika on because Shamika brings the brings brings the naked, and she can corroborate some of the logical things I was saying as I was seeing these things. So Shamika, what Shamika said about I don't know if somebody's Jewish. She said that on the air when we had another guest who was Jewish. Like I don't know what you're talking about, right? I don't know. What you're so this is what I'm saying. One of the, the the three or four major points that are important, but I think have been missing. And one is, and another is what Robert talks about in his books and everything. So Shamika's saying, I don't know whether somebody's Jewish or not, and don't really care. And, and they're saying, but what you say may tap into these anti Semitic tropes. So it's still anti Semitic. The argument is intent still, still matters, right? So if you're saying, if you just heard, picked up a stereotype along the way and you're telling a joke because you thought it was funny, or you're, you're, you're extrapolating a, a specific experience to the whole group, that would be wrong, right? But it doesn't necessarily make it anti-Semitic. It's like if you say something about Blacks that generalizes, it could be narrow-mindedness or, or ignorant, or it could be racist, right? It, you you got to flush. Things that, one of the things that Dave Chappelle in his, which I was very positive of his set, he said one of the things he learned when he started out is you cannot put two words next to each other. <laughs> the Jews. Right. He says, anytime you say the Jews, what you say after it is not going to work. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, you say the blacks, you say the this group, you have to be very careful that you are not generalizing. Because right, it basically and, means everybody. Mm -hmm. And anyway, so... But uh, it's allowed because people say the whites all the time. If you listen to people like Nicole Hannah Jones or Joy Reid, that's right. that's right. You know, they'll generalize, but they don't lose their job behind saying the whites. Well, well, and so I haven't seen anybody really lose their job behind saying the blacks. Nowadays, you may get in trouble a little bit. Like, you know, you might have to sit out uh, here and there, <laughs> but right. it's not. Like what what I've witnessed the last few weeks is something that is just brand new for me. Like I didn't even know about Michael Jackson's whole um, they don't really care about us. Like I didn't I don't remember him having to change the lyrics of the song and it being like this really big deal. Like all of that kind of went over my head just because I think I just never took the time to really hone in to somebody being Jewish or somebody or them being I don't know rulers or uh controlling everything or being like I heard it but I just never experienced it well, I just you know you know let me get into because I think that was the core of of Kanye West critique that these Jewish control of the entertainment industry, it messes over, over black artists. That was the most concrete thing he said. And Dave Chappelle built on that in his SNL monologue. He, he said, you know, I've been in Hollywood and there are a lot of Jews. A lot. And I mean a lot of Jews. Huh. And he said, and he can understand why Black people have this delusion 
of Jewish power. He used the word delusion of delusion. Jewish power. But it, it's okay for them to think that, but not for them to say it. So he's saying a truthful thing. He's not defending it. Right. Don't, don't saying, forget you left out one other important piece. After he said, I've been there and there's a lot of Jews. I mean, a lot. He, then he said, but that doesn't mean anything. There's a lot of black people in Ferguson. I don't mean they control the place. No, no, no. That's exactly right. right. But, but people have erased say, that. When I see people comment on they erase that part. It's like, what do you think it means by a lot? But he said it doesn't mean that they control it because they're there. They are overrepresented. You know, I mean, that that's pretty dishonest. They can, <laughs> you know, in 2009, all of the eight major studios in Hollywood were run by a Jewish men. All of them. And that's not the Weinstein brothers and Miramax, it's not the Cohen brothers and their film, you know, it that they and they control those studios. Mm -hmm. It isn't like, you know, in Ferguson, blacks were not the mayor, we're not this, this, and that. Here, Jews do well control Chicago, those DC, Baltimore, Atlanta. I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. So and you know, let me give some examples of how Jews have responded to that. So you have this issue, what, what um, uh, Chappelle said. He said, you know, if you got a bunch of blacks, they're called a gang. If you got a bunch of Italians, they're called a mob. And if you have a bunch of Jews, it's just incidental and you shouldn't talk about it. That's exactly what the head of the ADL in in ninth in 2010 said, Abe Foxman, he said, while it's true there were a lot of Jews in Hollywood, he said, instead of control, Foxman preferred people saying that many in the many executives in the industry happen to be Jewish. Mm -hmm. As if that you know, to obfuscate that it's not just they happen to be, they have more than an outside interest. Jesse Eisenberg, the actor who was up for the Academy Award in 2011 for Social Network, he said, I feel like I'm 13 and going to bar mitzvahs every week. Every week I get dressed up. This is during the awards season. Every week I get dressed up and I meet with a bunch of Jews. You know, so there it, it's there's a pervasive share of important people in Hollywood, including the, you know, the chief executives. And then, you know, the so it's not hard to understand why this becomes a sore point, uh, particularly when you think they're unfairly treating black uh, artists. There was an article in the New York Times about Preservation Hall in New Orleans. It was about five months ago, four or five months ago. A long article could be seven thousand ten thousand words going into the history of Pre preservation hall that's been able to keep jazz alive in new orleans but what they do is they give voice to this criticism of jews they interviewed um uh, this guy walter payton who's who who was uh well his son who's of his father was a longtime musician in Preservation Hall. And what they say is that how he described the adverse treatment of his father encapsulated many of the critiques one still hears that Jaffe, that's the Jewish family owners, can be perceived as a disrespectable, disrespectful and impervious boss that he puts the interest of himself in the hall above those of men who play there, that he pays musicians too little while the hall grows rich. 
And the article had no pushback on that. It didn't interview other other people who might have had a different view. It didn't, you know, so, and this is New York Times. This is, so there is this almost informed truth that yes, Jews may have unintentionally played an important role in bringing black culture to the center, but they did it in ways that were less than honorable. And, you know, how, how do you deal with that? I mean, I in my book, I have a chapter where I go into this in the jazz era, where 90% of the jazz record companies were Jewish, almost all of the managers of the top talent, black talent, were Jewish. Almost every one of the halls that you performed in, uh, like what's the one in Harlem? Uh, the Apollo. The hall. Uh, Apollo. Apollo, it was owned by Jews. You know, uh, Birdland was owned by Jews. You know, so you have, anyway, so I mean, I can go into that, why I think this informed wisdom of Jewish exploitation of black artists is just over the top. Uh, mm -hmm. But maybe you. Well, oh, let me let me go to Shemitah though, because because I understand that and I think that education is important. That's why I talk about that complicated relationship. But to be fair, on the other side, Shemika, so some of that you may have known, some of that you didn't know. So obviously, like he says, it's a, it's a give and take. Some of these artists in his book, if you go further back, the, the, the jazz era, but for these Jewish record owners and, and owning clubs, they wouldn't have been able to get on with their talent. I mean, because none of the other places were allowed on. So you got to give them credit for that. But, you know, maybe they you know took a little bit too much money. That's maybe it. they managed them poorly and all that kind of stuff. But here's my problem um, going the other way. So we'll get into how I think the blacks are being unfairly treated in this, this, in this current uh, debacle. But when you think about it that way, the problem is now Kanye set aside because Kanye seemed like he still would be in trouble, but maybe Kanye doesn't get as much trouble if he didn't say, like Dave Chappelle said, the Jews and paint as if it was all of them, just say, my, uh, this guy who managed my money ripped me off, or this guy who was my pr producer stole the rights to my music or something. It'd be more specific and call his name out. You're a billionaire, call him out, Johnny, whatever. But don't just say the Jews, that could be a problem. But that aside, what, what I see as a problem is, this may be true history, my concern is that it's what we hear, like Tamika, when we talk about, you talk about slavery and Jim Crow, and, and there, those are issues. But when, when certain people you talk about, I think you mentioned the Cohen Jones and others, you say, okay, we need to deal with some of this stuff, but we're acting like I'm, I'm dealing with this today. And I don't want my daughter learning this stuff and thinking she's a slave and thinking she could be a slave and all this kind of stuff. Well, it's kind of like that. So these things actually happen, right? But now you get a generation or two generation removed and people you know, they hand down these stories, right? So they're saying, well, grandpappy was this great jazz saxophonist, but this, this Jewish person owned this building and, and stole his money, right? So then we, we, we pass that story down like it's firsthand, right? So, so it stays, so the anger stays, even though it's 40 years ago. And then they don't pass down any positive stories, which I can give you some, you know, we talk about Booker T. Washington it, it overcame all this stuff and he opened all these schools in his adult. Now, granted, they call them the Rosenwald schools, but they don't say this Jewish guy who was the chairman of, uh, of Sears Roebuck. People know it, but the people who know it and know history know it, but it's not like as common place in the black community as the other things. So, the, so, so we commonly hear the Jews, you know, charged too much rent. The Jews did this. The storekeeper did this. The Jews, the Jews, the Jews. But they don't say, but if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be playing in the club. They don't say, but if it wasn't for, they were, you know, they they could pass as white, but they were on front lines in the civil rights movement. They didn't have to do that, you know, suing, uh, you know, certain states to um, to end segregation and things. So they, they played a part in other ways, but we only passed down this negative thing. And lastly, Shamika, you mentioned something right before we went to Robert about, hey, I'm in North Carolina and I didn't really see anybody. I had a shocking number of people reply to what I was saying, and they would say, well, it's this percentage of this in New York. And they was like, obviously, you've never been to New York. I was like, you do realize that there's 40 million Blacks and only 2 million of them live in New York. So you have to also 
understand that this has to come from somewhere in the sense most of us, our grandparents and our parents weren't ripped off by some bad record producer who was Jewish, right? And most of us don't live in New York, but you will admit that most Blacks have heard these Jewish treating us poorly stories. So where does that come from? So it's something about taking these these old old wives tales and these stories and spinning them too far. So while, while I don't think they're anti-Semitic, I think spreading so much negative, it's just because something you hear. You, you're in North Carolina, you've heard stuff about, you've heard the Jewing people down, you've heard all that stuff, even though you were never in New York. Right? You're like, no, I haven't. And in a lot of places, there, are, there were Jewish shopkeepers, Jewish landlords, you know, through the South yeah, and the elsewhere. South, yeah. And you know, so, but you're right about passing down stories. I mean, one of the famous ones is Scott Joplin, who was a major uh, artist in the turn of the century. Um, and he was, what was the kind of music? The rare time. Rare time. Mm -hmm. So he had a very famous hit in about, 1899 and but he didn't go anywhere but Irving Berlin became the largest selling ragtime person he was a black genre a black genre of music ragtime and Irving Berlin just appropriates the con right and he has the biggest hit Alexander's ragtime band in 1915. Scott Joplin's family for 40 years argued that he ripped off Scott Joplin, that if you look at other compositions of Scott Joplin, you know, I don't think it's true and other people don't, but you have these kinds of stories that just take on a life of their own where, you know, it's true. Irving Berlin did in many ways appropriate uh, ragtime and be, was very successful with it. Uh, so, you know, there, and that's, you know, from the jazz era, there were lots of stories about this person being ripped off of that, that just take on a life of their own. And I think that it just, all of these things feed in because it's, it's a backdrop in the black community in many places that this example of Jews doing this or Jews, not everywhere, but it's a backdrop. So then when something comes up that is untoward through to blacks, it, it gives a, a resonance to it that it would not ordinarily have. Right. So, you know, you have these black Israelites, you have uh, the nation of Islam, that have a certain amount of anti-Semitism. I mean, the Nation of Islam, well, here's Will. <laughs> How you doing? Uh, Pretty good. Yeah. Right, yeah so, yeah. Sorry sorry about these delays. This is pretty ridiculous. Good to see you, Bob. We we all are pretty good friends on this call. Yes, so I, I'm know, gonna, I know. But, I'm going to take know, an I'm herbal saying, upper called Pray Tom right now. <laughs> that there's just this kind of backdrop that feeds into, and there are these organizations that provide a certain intellectual credibility. I mean, the books that made this movie, Hebrew to Blacks, that Kyrie Irving uh, mentioned on, uh, he tweeted about, mm -hmm. those books that that documentary came from there are seven of the top 10 books on one of Amazon's lists of African-American biographies. That is, these, these ideas have, have a reasonable, I don't want to overstate it, mm -hmm. but the ideas have a reasonable currency and the inability to push back against Louis Farrakhan and his anti-Semitism is appalling. I mean, you know, you can you have leaders of Black Lives Matter, of the women's movement, who will not dissociate themselves from Barricade. 
And when he was, when he was at, uh, there was a celebration of Aretha Franklin's death. And there were four people who were the honored guests. There was Bill Clinton, there was uh, Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, and Louis Farrakhan. Most of the newspapers propped out Farrakhan. That if you looked at it, you wouldn't know that Farrakhan was one of the honored people. And they did that because they didn't have to defend it. So, you know, there's a there's a lot of underbelly. And it isn't that everyone believes that Hebrew Israelites or is a nation of Islam fan, but there is this currency that certain ideas have. And uh, it's dormant in many ways, but it can rise up when there are incidents. All right. So, Samika, what do you think? Of, I was going to ask you, what do you think about that, about the stories and that kind of thing? Uh, like you said, you I think you were saying you didn't really hear those. I don't think I really heard those. And that I'm I guess I have a question like have Jews kind of gotten away like for black people to be angry? Do you think instead of uh, black people focusing on white supremacy, they should have been focused on Jew supremacy? Because, like, for me, I just didn't grow up with those type of stories. And so I don't think people that mistreated people in the record industry or entertainment industry or landlords or whatever did so because they were Jewish. I would feel like they mistreated people and they just happened to be Jewish, just like they could happen to be white or happen to be black or happen but to be- One of the issues is this issue of mistreatment. I don't think that that's true. So for example, in the record industry in the 1950s, you had people like Sid Nathan and King Records in Cincinnati. It was the first business that hired black in their businesses to produce the records. They were one of the companies that produced their own records. And if you wanted to work in the King record company, you had to say you were willing to work with blacks. If you weren't willing to work with blacks, you weren't hired. This is in 1947. We're not talking about 1967, 1947. And I can give many other stories of the Chess Brothers, uh, what they did so that this whole idea that blacks might have been ripped off and we should be careful that it was by individual owners, not people who happen to be Jewish, is already giving away too much. One of the things that happened in the 1950s is that 90% of the jazz record companies went bankrupt because jazz was never an overly popular music in terms of sales in the black community. It was the white community. And once rock and roll came about in the 50s, the jazz industry declined. So you had a situation in which you have companies going under. So how do you talk about so easily underpaying black artists when, you're, when your business is going under? So Yes, they're, and the record company is complicated because you give advances to people and you hope to make that back when they sell records. But what happens if they don't sell records? You know, you're stuck with all you paid. So the record industry is pretty complicated, particularly in a situation where it was declining. So the Newport Jazz Festival, which went on for 50 years or more. That was run by a guy, George Wine, a Jewish pianist, jazz pianist. And he was in this declining industry and just like Preservation Hall, he had to make a lot of compromises for that, for those concerts to survive. So he would, he would bring in people who weren't pure jazz artists but they had names so that you would get attendance and he wouldn't pay like Miles Davis and others. He wouldn't pay them what they thought they should get paid. 
but it wasn't like he got rich. He was, it was survival. And that's, that's the problem. You can look at the companies, the few companies that survived like Atlantic records, uh, but they went out of the jazz business. Atlantic survived because it went into rock and roll. Savoy, that was the initiators of bebop in the late 40s, early 50s, they only, ta- they only started to make money when they went into gospel music in the late 50s. So you have a very complicated situation in capitalism where, sure, if you look at the successful, the few businesses that were successful, you could say they ripped off this or they ripped off that. But that was a it was a very tough industry. And but, but uh, let's fast forward to, to now though, Shamika. So he's talking, you know, jazz in the 50s and 40s. But you hear rappers, I mean, not in now with Kanye obviously had plenty of complaints, but even in the 80s and 90s, right? You had that there was this this as much as there might be may have been some angst in the community in that relationship you know what would you 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 had to appear things like i mean one you talk about the producers and the people who started death row and the people who are uh, you know you're running these record labels now you hear rappers talk about that but then you also hear black people talking about man i gotta get me a jewish lawyer right it's always like so they would also say you know if i want i'm gonna get you know you know uh, somebody no you didn't hear this stuff either no they would rap about jews man you know Ice Cube talk about um, the white Jew in No Vaseline. That's kind of right. how it was brought to my attention right. that can there I, are- Can I jump in for- somebody? Uh-huh. Go ahead, Will. Can I, yeah. can I jump in for a second to someone who's in the nightlife business? D- d- despite my absurd lateness and personal cynicism, I think one thing I will say is this is also something you hear from the outlaw country artists in Appalachia. This is also something you hear from metal artists I don't mean to at all disrespect the black artists. I mean, like, I think Easy e did get screwed with no Vaseline. I don't think that was just because he had a Jewish manager. But a lot of people don't understand how the business game works. So, like, an advance, for example. An advance is something I got for my book. When you get an advance, they give you, say, $200,000. I'm going to put that out there as a hypothetical. And the assumption is that you're going to sell $200,000 worth of manuscripts or records. And if you don't, they take that money back from you. And I think for a lot of these hillbilly kids and a lot of, it's about, it got to be a better way to say that. And for a lot of these brothers from inner city areas and probably for a lot of these Jewish guys back in the 1940s, that wasn't necessarily understood. The idea was the man gave me this money and then the man came and took this money back. No, you didn't make any money. Like some guy that owned a bunch of candy stores gave you that money because he thought you would be profitable and you weren't. And now you guys are at close to a fist fight level in terms of whether you can repay him. So I I think that's realistic. Uh, One thing that Bob said. It's not so much that they had to repay, but they got no royalties for the records they sold. And that's true of books. You got an advance. And until you get past your advance, Right. You get zero royalties. Right. Well, so, I, I understand it. I actually, I was in a, well, it wasn't a lucky position. I'm a good writer, as you are, Bob, and as you are, Charles, and as you are, Shamika. I mean, that's why none of us are poor, frankly. But I mean, like, it, if you don't make that money back, yeah, a lot of unfortunate, embarrassing things go on. One thing that, Bob, though, that you said uh, in an email, this was almost, uh, hopefully not off the record, but it was this question of middleman minorities. Like, I think the reason that Blacks, Jews, Italians, Irishmen, Mexicans have had a lot of issues with one another is that they've all kind of lived in the hood together. So, I mean, if you're Black, why have you had an issue with Jewish people? Because you've had a Jewish landlord. Your landlord wasn't the Anglo-Saxon laird that actually owned a good chunk of that city. It was the Jewish guy that owned three buildings. Right. I mean, and similarly, so on down the line. I mean, now in my old neighborhood, East Aurora, people might be surprised to hear this, but you have Mexicans, Mexicans. Mexican-Americans that have these issues with Black and Caribbean landlords. And so it's kind of like these uh, these N-words are exploiting us. They're too, they're too lazy to work, so they own buildings. And all this is going on among people. Like, there's no one that a guy with a penny hates more than a guy with a nickel. So all this is stuff that was going on in, like, New York, Chicago, 
Uh, there are real issues between blacks and Jews, the leadership of the civil rights movement, real stuff we can talk about. But a lot of this stuff, I, I think, is brotherhood quarrels, kind of. I, and, know, I, I mentioned this in the beginning when you were here, that that's the distinction. <laughs> fair for, enough. <laughs> being of stereotypes. No, no. That this issue. I'm half white, though. With Jews is that they have relationships. They've had relationships, whether it's landlords, record owners, they have had relationships with black Americans. And that's much different than white anti-Semitism, you know, general white anti-Semitism of either the right or the left, who don't have any relationship to Jews, but they don't like Jews for A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. With blacks, it's fundamentally perceptions of relationships. And uh, so well, I, what well, Shamika? I agree. You know, I, I, this is cut the bull, and I like to go to Shamika when I want things said that I don't want to say, so I can say I didn't say and don't get in trouble. But <laughs> that was incredibly honest. Because <laughs> at the end of the day, I still didn't say Shamika. So, so there's another strain in this we have to get to that I found I don't know problematic, but I think it was the wrong approach. So I, I will con uh, confess that we may disagree on this, but I think. Kanye got a little personal, a little crank, right? Should have made it individual, not person. Kyrie, whatever his views are, they could be wrong. He didn't really put enough out there, I think, to get attacked as much as he was. He posted a link. I mean, everything else was assumption. You assumed what he meant by it, right? And Dave Chappelle was a comedian, leave him alone. That said, if you are upset and, and if they need to learn a little more nuance, a better way to approach it, or if they need to learn about Jewish people, Am I wrong, Shamika, in thinking that the worst way to get these blacks in line and to get them to understand what Jews went through is to bring up the Holocaust? What I tried to get people to understand is outside of denying it, which is bad, but if the, if Dave Chappelle at you know and all the others are wrong and you want to educate them, they need to understand that what they're saying is dancing on the line on, of anti-Semitism. The one way is guaranteeing not to get them to be on your side and to get them to dig in. And I don't know, hypothetically, get them to to tweet some, you know, pretty clearly racist uh, joke, you know, some about 10 pounds or something. The one quick way to do that is to bring up the Holocaust, because blacks in America see things, see race in America, uniquely American. They understand that, uh, that minorities, immigrants, and, and, and Jews had all came here because they were suffering something, something else when they came here. But it wasn't here. It's the reason Dave Chappelle made that line to say, leave Kyrie alone. It's Kyrie ass was nowhere near the Holocaust, right? So when Blacks, uh, especially Blacks, I mean, even, even service, but especially liberal Blacks who are, are talking about slavery all the time, and you bring up the Holocaust, they're going to instantly get defensive and be like, well, it becomes the oppression Olympics, and we're always going to win that Olympic. And then it's like, well, at the end of the day, then screw you then. Now I'm going to dig deeper. So don't you think, I don't know if you saw any of that. And if so, don't you think that that's the wrong approach to try to educate Blacks on anti-Semitism? Yeah, I definitely think it's the wrong approach. And like for somebody like myself, if I'm not stuck in slavery, if I'm not constantly bringing up slavery for somebody to feel sorry for me or to give me an extra push or, you know, why then should I feel differently about the Holocaust? Like, I think that was a tragedy. I think it was horrific. I've been to the Holocaust Museum in, in D.C. I, I was like, wow, my gosh, that's awful. But why should I care about that more than any other thing? And I'm trying to figure out why Jews feel like they're much more special than any other person. If I'm going to, if I can tell a joke about a black, if I can tell a joke about a white, an Irish, an Italian, why can't I tell a joke about a Jew? I don't care um, any more than somebody else uh else's ancestors have been through that was then this is now and like we can talk about people that are in power but then you got mary bernstein i'm i'm guessing that's a a, a jewish name you got See, mary you're getting bernstein better you get better in, in in idaho who Pretty. has less money in her bank account than i do feeling like I owe her some type of extra special privilege because she's Jewish. First of all, Mary, no, sit down. You ain't no better than my grandma or my great grandma. 
why why should I have to bow to uh, the Jewish people just because they're Jewish? And they'll say, well, that you don't I have think, to bow. You just need to understand how, no, how people I around the world. It. That's yeah, what I'm saying. You can't force somebody all, to understand. All of us on this panel, though, I think would say this because this is the same thing that's said to blacks. Like, why can't I make a joke about black people? And the answer going back to Don Rickles and Chris Rock and so on is, well, you, you can. can. The issue the issue is that that five or 10 percent of people that are like, no, you can't. And I, w I would guarantee that the same people that are like, no, you can't make a Jew joke would be the same people that are like, no, you can't make a black joke. And I that's why Dave know. Chappelle. No, that's no, what no, surprised me. I had people you saying it to me. Two different cadres? No, I had some groups? people. No, I had some people come to me that the, the that this was what shocked me. Yes, you're right. A That's lot weird. of them were like okay. that. But I had some people who were like thinking mm -hmm. it's silly, the whole wokeness and saying my truth and saying blacks can say but black only blacks know what racism is. They say that's silly. But then they say, and let but then after Dave Chappelle, they're like, unless you're Jewish, you don't really get to speak on what's anti-Semitic. No. Well, first of all, you have mm -hmm. to be careful because my reading of the Jewish press. And uh, is that, by and large, Dave Chappelle was not at most muted criticism by broadly in the Jewish press. Now, you can get people like this woman in Idaho. You can get all kinds of people who uh -huh. are not representative. And let me give a, an example of this issue of the Holocaust. One of the things that is important for most Jewish people is not to be thought of as victims. And I'll give an example. If you Rosa. speak to reform Jews broadly, they ha there's this statement of what are the nine words that define a Jew? The nine words are they tried to kill us we won, let's eat. So it, it, it's be, so you say, let's eat, you're not playing the victim card. You're basically saying, we were able to rise above and let's celebrate. And I think that this idea about the Holocaust is kind of complicated. Part of it is, that my wife is the child of survivors. She was born in a DP camp in Germany in 1947. So there's this Holocaust community, which is not insignificant. For them, it's very personal. Now they're almost all dying off, but they have children. So, I mean, I think there, there's a kind of group within the Jewish community that has a very personal, not just religious, but a very personal relationship to the Holocaust. And so they may not react in the most progressive way about it. But as I said, with that nine words, what makes a Jew, a Jew that there's much more of this sense of uh, rejoicing in succeeding to survive mm -hmm. and moving forward. And, you know, there was this 1960s film, The Producer, which was uh, starred as Zero Mostel and uh, was, who was the? Gene, Gene. Um, Gene Wilder, Wilder was in yes. it. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it was uh, this Jewish producer who I'm blocking on, who did, uh, space balls and uh, Mel Brooks. Uh, Mel, Mel, what? Mel Brooks. Mel Brooks. Yeah, Mel He's Brooks. Jewish. Spring time for Hitler. And, yeah. and yeah. what does he do in that? What has he got? The central feature of that movie is that he wants to produce a, a flop so right. he could rip off all of the people who invested in the film. So he decided to make a musical you know, about all this Hitler. money. And so he makes the central song Springtime Spring time for Hitler. For Hitler. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it's not as if there, and there are other examples of movies and others where uh, Jews can take a joke right. on even yeah. the if, Holocaust. If I can, 
if I can jump in, because I I think Charles normally has the best the best questions of this kind. But I mean, like, don't you think a lot of this is just situational time frame? Like, if you look at like Blazing Saddles or CB4, I mean, there's a song like the niggers got the gun. Excuse the language. Like, I mean, this this is just comedy that went on right. until 2005. Right. Like, I'll yeah. shoot him. I'll shoot that N word. You know, and Blazing Nobody Saddles one of the funniest. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I'll kill that nigger. I mean, like Blazing Saddles one of the funniest movies of all time. CB4 where they all pretending to be gangsters. I mean, and then that's that's specifically mocking the career of a oh, specific it's... rap group that we won't name. We all know it though. <laughs> I mean, like uh, all of that went on. Blacks, Jews, again, Italian Americans get shorty. Like everyone used to have much more of a sense of humor ironically at the same time when much many more of us used to know people that had been shot in the ass in the old neighborhood so i, I don't know if it's jews or blacks that are moving away from it's the culture it's the culture i grew up with way. sticks and stones can break your bones but names can never harm you actually you know, i'll say one thing i think it's upper middle class anglo white kids that are moving away from humor like, I, I think that that's yeah. that demographic group. When you look at white, upper-class women, like, there's one group that supports political correctness. Even, I don't want to say even Jews, but it's, it's not the groups that we're talking about. Well, can I can I, can I I move to one other possibility, which may, it's not a, a last thing that's not said that much, but I think maybe I'm wrong, but to see your, your, your views and see if this plays a part. Do you think that, I was going to say political, I want to say political, that there's a viewpoint. Now, now I'm piggybacking on Will. Will's right that there's just a whole things you can't, the office you can't make now. There's a lot of things you can't do now because everybody's just so sensitive. But beyond that, yeah, you know, play my, my Andy Rooney. You ever notice how, how when, you know, certain people say things they shouldn't say and another group said things they don't say, based on their views, they, they react differently. So I don't, I mean, it's not lost on me. I haven't completed the theory, but I do find that you got Kanye, Kyrie, and who's the last one? Dave Chappelle. Right. They all said some things people don't like. They tried to cancel Dave before on the transgender thing. Right. So if I take them and I take, I don't know, Mark Lamont Hill. So what did you say, Shamik? Uh, Shamik, you said like Joy Reid or somebody, somebody on MSNBC and so somebody at a BLM yeah. march, I think uh, Robert said. You take the six of them, right? They get a pass. They're still in Congress. The squad's still in Congress. Anti-Semitism. Uh, Mark Lamont Hill from the River to the Sea. Robert can explain what that is. Still, still. I mean, he's not on TV because the network got canceled, not because he got canceled. Right. But I think that the, the other thing these three com currently in trouble have in common were MAGA hat, vaccine mandate, transphobia, right? So is it just what they said or is it that they were so heterodox on these other things? And if they were more, you know, with the program on these other things, then they'd be upset, but they get a slap on the hand. Not we want, we must take everything from you, not the Ivan Draco. We must break you. Uh, anybody want to want to take a shot at that? Oh, I definitely feel like that played a part. I do. I feel like, especially with the uh, vaccine uh, with Kyrie. Kyrie, they've been waiting to hang him since he mm -hmm. defied them with that. You can't use the hang analogy, because like the Holocaust was Jews, that brings about a, a black... Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. See? <laughs> oh, by yeah. the way, the HBCU bomb threats, all fake. Just had to get that in there. Yeah, some teenager, right? I saw your post. It was like some. Oh, you. One, I, I wonder what Shamika has to I say, but yeah, like. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Shamika. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know that was fake. You have to come back to that. I mean, I thought it was fake, but I didn't know it had been confirmed. Um, so yeah, I definitely feel like that had something to do with it, and I think the fact that especially uh, Yay wore the uh, Make America Great Again hat, mm -hmm. and the White Lives Matter. They hit him at the perfect time because black people were mad at him, too. So it was like they didn't really come to his rescue like maybe they would have if they hadn't already been angry with him for wearing that hat and that T-shirt. And so I think they thought, OK, we can move in on Kyrie the same way. And people were like, wait a minute, because they weren't mad at Kyrie. Right. And so I think it just didn't turn out the way they thought it would like, you know, you're not going to be able to railroad him the way you did. Yay. Well, Robert. Well, no, I mean, I think it's, I think it's true that there wasn't goodwill 
to at least those two, and and certainly Dave Chappelle for the trans stuff. Uh, and as was mentioned, I mean, with Kyrie, he just, I don't think he had any idea what was in that stuff. You know, he's... Right, because uh, he would have made a comment. He wouldn't just send the link. He would have said, love the part where they said the Holocaust was fake. No, I and, you know, look, and I think uh, the basketball community has pushed back against Starting to, yeah. his how he's treated. You know, LeBron James, who signals what, you know, has... <laughs> oh, uh, don't get Shamika upset. LeBron James only said something because he got called out by Farrakhan. Yeah. So as yeah. much as people want them to, to, to denounce Farrakhan, there are a lot of people that actually do respect him. I don't feel like he would have pivoted until he got a lot of pressure from the black community and and Farrakhan, LeBron James from the black yeah. community to stand up for Kyrie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, yeah I don't. Right. I'm not so in like, those. <laughs> you know, know. You, you don't get invited to those meetings, Robert. Two kind no, of no, 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 but it, actually, I actually think Robert might occasionally. But like two, two quick comments here. Like one, just one sentence. Obviously, there are real double and triple standards here. Like there are groups you can talk shit about. Like I live in Appalachia. Poor whites are one of them. There are other groups, Mormons. There, there's a whole play on Broadway. We've mostly well, seen it. Jews. You right? can yeah, say on uh, Hasidic Jews. Shemika does it all the time. But Hasidic Jews, maybe. But like in general, there are other groups in society, like mainstream right, African but in New York City, middle class Jews. Okay, like gay people. They're groups where if you're in the upper middle class and you talk shit about them, you're going to have trouble with your job. Like, that's it. One sentence. We all know yeah. that. You can talk shit about poor whites or like Frenchmen or something like that. You can't. You're probably not going to start on blacks if you're a white guy. That's point one. Point two, if pointing out hypocrisy is one thing, I do think that there's a lot of tolerance. And here's what I'm going to call out my group. There's a lot of tolerance in the black community for kind of crazy shit. Like, I actually, and there, there's a lot of tolerance in the white community for crazy shit, too. I mean, the Klan still exists. But like, I looked at Hebrews to Negroes, and it's absolutely batshit insane. And, like, the black Hebrew Israelites exist. There are a lot of brothers out there that think the ancient Egyptians were black. And the first Jews were black. And the Native American Indians were black. Everybody so black. just as we call out stuff when Jewish Americans and so on do it, you, you kind of have to point that out. Like... I read a scientific paper the other day. This was sent to me for review in my job, like African contact with the new world. And it was like, I don't know about <laughs> that. I don't know if, uh, I mean, Monsa, by the way, Mansa Musa had a pretty significant Navy, Mansa Kida, like there were very civilized Iron Age African societies that's minimized. But like, were they sailing over here? Like, what is it? Eight tenths around? No. So it's, it, you can say that a lot of this stuff is just crazy and like everyone has crazy stuff they believe but a lot of the stuff on the black side like 25 percent of black people believe aids was invented by the cia in a lab like if you're going to have a real conversation between blacks and whites and jews and so on you also have to call out that black piece of it like that's nuts like hebrews to negroes that's absolutely crazy like the things he said are not real right. you know so Factually, and inaccurate. by the way, a lot of the a lot of the craziest white supremacist types, like Nick Fuentes. Nick Fuentes is like, what is he? If do you guys know who this is? Some young, really yeah. young guy, right? Yeah, yeah, he's but he's the young cat who's Fuentes. on the alt right, but he <laughs> he's like he's he's Latino. He's like a quarter right. Afro Latino, and the rest just Mexican. But he'll he'll say this shit, like he'll say the ovens weren't big enough for the Holocaust to operate. That's that's, that's not that's, accurate, that's, and that's not a white guy and people have to be have to stand up and say okay no that that's in our community and that's wrong well, just I, I think, i'll go ahead that, that's it i mean that that's like the holocaust happened slavery happened like right. everyone has to call out their nuts that that's kind of that's libs of tiktok <laughs> world like when the craziest guy in your team steps up you have to be like nope not on squad. Go ahead, Shamika. Yeah. <laughs> I just think I go even further. Like, for one, I couldn't even make it through all of that documentary because it just didn't capture my attention. And I think part of that yeah. is because I don't care. Like, and I don't even understand yeah. why there's like an argument of something that happened 
But, but she right. makes a good point. Way back you're, you're right that it's correct. There's wrong will, but what if she's right? What if it's just like, okay, so you are the original Jews. Now what? Yeah, like <laughs> I don't like and what? And what? And what? What does that mean? Like I just don't care. Yeah, it's, it's well, good. the funniest conversation I've ever actually heard about this was between it was two guys that were good friends. This was on a trading floor. It was between a Nigerian and a British guy. And the Nigerian was like, you know, everything in the world began in Africa. These guys were both upper, upper class and they had these accents. Nigerian was like, everything in the world began in Africa. And the British guy was like, well, what's happened to you motherfuckers since? And like both of them just <laughs> laughed and then they went and closed their deals. But it, it is kind of like, well, if, if the first Jews were black, well, why aren't Aren't they anymore? But the the simple reality is like we now we have GWAS DNA and so on. We know like Egyptians. So th this is one of those pet peeves for me. You gonna Egyptians get in weren't black, and they weren't white in the sense that I think of that. Like well, no one was really black. But go on. I'm, what's up? I said well, no one was really black in the way they define it today. But you're right. Yes. Well, no, no. Like the Nubians, the people that conquered Egypt during the dynasty of the Black Pharaohs, they look like. You actually like yeah, yeah they, they, they didn't they, look like the Moses. No, they, I'm not, I'm not saying no one looked black back then. Like, he's making a. Yeah, the, they're not the Bantu <laughs> were from like an area south of the Sahel, but I mean, like, I mean, but the point is that like Egyptians aren't black or white; they're Egyptian. Right. Like, you, if you want to see what an Egyptian looks like, I don't want to say like go to the corner store, but like there are plenty the of East. people of Arabic descent today. Yeah. Yeah. It's not hard to find an Arab. So I mean, it, we. The idea that we don't understand these cultures, these peoples, and we have basically one sentence. It's a bad idea, whether you're Black or Anglo-White or of Jewish descent, to attribute everything in history to your group. And this is a classic human fallacy. There's an 1835 book called An Irishman Was There. And it's like every event in history, like there was an attempt to stick someone from Ireland in there probably because then people from Ireland were suffering a lot of abuse in this country, almost on par with Blacks. You see that a lot with Black people now. And there's almost an element of cope. Like, yeah, the first guy to build a chair, Black. Not really. But 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 so so we can end on piggybacking on that. What do we do? How do we, because this is going in the wrong direction. And I, I know we that- We pick on everybody. That's what we do. Well, pick I mean, on everybody. Yeah, you know, you're going to do that, of course. But I'm just saying yeah. this narrative- <laughs> it's like the one thing the other thing that just shocked me though i'm watching shamika and i'm watching all these people on twitter especially it, it ramped up after dave Chappelle. and the one thing that made me laugh was you know with the exception of the crazies a few you know mark lamont hill lebron james the people who are just you know being pulled laid around on chains but but a lot of the people left right and center in the black community were all like on board they were all like nope I'm defending this, right? Especially Kyrie, a little bit Kanye. They thought Kanye went too far, but I, I, I was, I was shocked in the, to see, you know, black, black liberals and black conservatives. You got Jason Whitlock and Shamika talking on Fearless. You got, uh, I'm trying to remember who the other. You got Boyce Watkins. You had, you had all these people, and they're all saying the same thing. This is crazy. Stop calling them anti-Semitic or saying that we're all. So, so it's like because it almost went from you know stop picking on the Jews to hey. Stop piling up on black folks, <laughs> right? So then it just became, I don't know what he said, but you're not going to just label us all as anti-Semitic. Well, what my concern is that for better or worse, I think Chappelle and has raised this issue of Jewish exploitation of black in the entertainment industry in a way that you know, reinforces certain views that that exploitation was widespread and whether, and we have to be careful, it was individual Jews, it wasn't the Jewish the people, Jews. the Jews, right? but that it, what's sticking is this notion that that relationship was fundamentally exploitive. And I think that has some serious problems in in bringing any kind of sympathetic or uh, view of Jews in the black community uh, or a balanced view of it. Uh, and, you know, it's just unfortunate. Jamika, what are your thoughts? What are you, I, I know you said make fun of everybody, but... Uh... 
but but how do but that 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 only fixes one side of it, I guess. I don't think that stops uh, the the Jewish people who think that this is anti-Semitic from thinking so. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think you're right. <laughs> yeah, I I don't think I care. Um, but you're hurting I, their feelings. I feel like you said what? But you're hurting their feelings. I don't care. But you but, but, but you're promoting but you're making people yeah. the re, do you know the reason the the Jewish guy got punched by some young black guy in Brooklyn 3 weeks ago is because of Dave, Dave Chappelle's monologue. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's what they're going to say and that's just ridiculous. The Jewish guy pissed that black guy off or that black guy is just, it's just an ignorant has bully. his own prejudices, you know? I can't I don't have anything to do with that. But I do think that I'm an equal opportunity person. I'm going to joke on everybody. I'm going to love on everybody. And I don't think I can be anti-Semitic if I can't even point you out. Well, can you, so, uh, lastly, like, I'm glad you mentioned joking. Do you want to explain the joke that you, the, the, the joke that you posted? So this is a joke. You want me to just tell it? You can tell it yeah. and then explain why you posted it. Because <laughs> okay. I think it's going to need to know. So the joke is, there was a black guy walking along the beach when he came across a bottle in the sand. So he picked up the bottle, he rubbed it, and out popped a Jewish genie. So the Jewish genie uh, said, I will grant you one wish. And the black guy immediately said, I want to be white, tight, and out of sight. So the genie said, poof, and turned him into a tampon. The moral of the story is, you can't get anything from a Jew without a string attached. That was a joke. <laughs> Robert laughed. It's not a bad joke. You're in so much trouble, Robert. Okay, so why well, why did you post that joke in the in the midst of this black Jew fighting heat? Why did you post that joke? Yeah, because I just think people need to get over themselves. Like I have another joke that that where. Um, you know, black people are the punchline. White man, black man, Jew man. You know, where a black the black people are the punchline, which I'll probably post that tomorrow. I just want people to get over themselves. Like you, I don't think you should not like people because of their color of their skin or their ethnicity or their religious views. You shouldn't dislike them for that. And I don't think any of those things should make them off limits for, for jokes either. Like, let's just live life. Let's just have fun. Let's, you know, crack a joke on each other. You know, it's a stereotype that all Black people like watermelon and fried chicken. I'm not going to see that and get mad and feel like that's anti-Black. Mm -hmm. Right? I'm just, it's funny. That's fine. I'm gonna go to Will, but I do have one last question. Of course, just real quick. See, we, uh, let me just a lot of push back against. Let me push back against this tampon joke. Mm -hmm. You know, there's <laughs> that you laugh at, but I'm sorry. I understand, but one of the things is, it only makes sense if you believe a certain stereotype about Jews. If you don't believe that stereotype, it's a weird joke. So the idea that well, what if you just know the stereotype no. but you don't believe it, right? And what yeah. if you just heard it? Because if somebody made a, a a fried chicken joke, my mama don't even like fried chicken, but no, I think no, no, I, but would, I would find it funny. Still, it, it wouldn't fair. be. Yeah, I think there's a you know there's a difference between jokes about food that you're talking about and jokes about perceived behaviors. Okay, people. what about killing? Yeah, what about Don Rinkles and his and his violent crimes? Like I was in an alley not... with an Italian. Where's my wallet? No, what no, what no, about no. SNL? I understand. But again, saying... those jokes, those jokes had credibility because there was a perce perception of Italian gangsters. So oh, we'll you know eyebrows. there are I think one has to be careful if the sole way a joke will make sense if there is a stereotype that people accept. Okay. Uh, what about them saying the new Superman is black and he's going to be called the Man of Steel, but it's going to be S T E A L? Well, that is a racist joke. That's really joke. funny, actually. <laughs> 
no, no, that, no. that's a really funny joke. Like, yeah. so just to I mean, jump in, like my my all time favorite ethnic joke is just a joke I heard in the gym when I was a high school athlete. What's ten inches long and white? Nothing. It's the the whole idea is like white guys are slightly worse lovers, athletes, so on. Is that true? Well, I don't know, but I mean, it's. I've never been but one, but you don't have to accept the premise yeah, of the joke you know, to get like, okay, we're ripping on each other. We the the idea is you guys are poor, you guys are too rich, you're cake eaters, so on down the line. You don't have to accept you know, it. Having a joke that relies on the view that the stereotype of blacks being thieves is you got to be careful because it for many people about, who hear what it. What about whites being small cocked sex offenders? What? But what I mean, I don't mean to interrupt, Rob, but what about like whites being small cocked sex offenders, which is the joke yeah, there? Like what's 10 inches long and white? Nothing. No, no, no. But I mean that's a lot different than the stereotype, you know. So having a poor small penis is is I I'd rather be a thief than have a tiny penis. But it still does okay, the job. Okay, Robert, but... Robert, is it different when you're on stage and not stage? So if you're on stage, do, do you get carte blanche? Can you say whatever you want if you're on stage? I don't know. I think you have to be careful with there are certain very, very harmful stereotypes. I what think... if it's just really, really mean ethnic stuff? Okay, like right. I know the, uh, the two of them know. Do you know, uh, and he's older, you probably know. Do you re remember the comedian Paul Mooney? Who wrote for Richard Pryor? Yeah. Do you remember his when he got on the stage? Will what was his line all the time? Remember? I mean, he, he had a whole bunch of them. He was super but, but negative. For, no, Richard Pryor was. was I hate white stupid. people. Oh, yeah. I hate white people. I hate white people. At the bottom of my heart. Right. But I no, I mean, people. I hate white people. I, right. I think that everyone does these jokes. And I mean, I, you you almost, all of us are successful business people at this point. You almost don't want to get canceled. But like thinking about some of these old, like things Mike Royko used to put in columns, like why can't a Puerto Rican use a checkbook? Because it's too small to spray paint his name on. Like there were just constant comedy about everyone, Polish Americans, Jewish Americans, Black Americans, so on down the line. Um you know how do the there's this is the last ethnic joke i'm probably ever going to tell on this show for one reason or another but like i mean the old chicago joke how does a polish pilot navigate any of you guys ever heard this mm -mm. No. by reading the street signs i've heard it as black pilot too i mean so like with that the, the implication is polish people are stupid of course polish oh, there are a lot of those old polish jokes when i grew up Polish people used to have a very low tested IQ. Now they don't, by the way. I'm a culturalist on IQ. I don't, I don't know if everyone's going to catch Ashkenazi Jews, but black people are up to about 93, 94. Polish people up to about 98. When It turns out when you on eat, up. turns out when every, everyone is going on up. It turns out when you have food and school, and your IQ improves. I mean, I this know. isn't a joke. I mean, like the scores that we get from testing people in places like Albania aren't real. Like it's actually racist to say, well, this is reality. The score in Congo is 71. And But anyway, the point is that I don't think that anyone listening to those jokes that we all heard as athletes or whatnot in high school actually believes that the average IQ score for a Polish man is 71. So there, there is, I think there's a place for that on the comedy stage. Right. And obviously I'll, I'll add the caveat, you know, I'm an academic now, I wouldn't tell those jokes in a classroom or something like that. But I don't think listening to them or even enjoying them implies that you're a racist. Well, well, I know we, we, we run out of time, but I just want to remind one, I want to say about the comedy thing, that's where we differ, Robert. I draw the line on stage, say whatever you want. Right now, if you you should deliver and okay. it should be funny and it should be well crafted, but some comedians are going to suck, so they're going to say a joke that intended to be funny and it wasn't funny before. But I'm like, if you're on stage, it doesn't mean that Dave Chappelle can be in the grocery store and just say crazy stuff and it's okay. But on stage, you should be able to say what he wants. <laughs> but uh, and then and then Shamika, I want to remind you though, you talked about that joke and you talked about you know whatever. I just want to remind you that what did you say your daughter wanted to do again? Which one? The one that wants is has wants going to come to New York. That I don't want to come to New York. Yeah. But what does she want to do? Theater. Theater. Eh. Okay. You better you better cut those jokes down a little bit. Is all I'm saying. 
<laughs> I mean, a lot. A lot. <laughs> Look, no. <laughs> Will, uh, any, any last points you... <laughs> now I'm in trouble. See, I should have just let Shamika say that. Well, I actually do have one kind of serious look, point here. I'm sorry, Will, before cutting, cutting you off. Right. Charles, you the only one just brought attention to it. So now it ain't even about me. It's about you bringing her into the conversation <laughs> that she won't even in. So now you oh. in trouble with me. Oh, for saying That's she's going to be a great a actress? Good place to be. If she can get a role? No, for because it ain't nobody's business um, what my child want to do. She not on this podcast. I am. And we're all actually pretty famous and we'll probably help her do some things. But like the, the one I actually would say one final thing about this, though, if you guys don't mind, I would be interested in, in Shamika's conclusion, certainly. But like I do think and this is important that there's a distinction between one. This is a joke, right? And oh. Ethnic realities. Start and over being you racist. froze right when you said so this like the. No, but like, so the joke, like checkbook spray paint, that that's a joke that's allowable on stage. I would say we can debate that. So that that's one hand. The second hand would be like, if I wanted to say there are a lot of secular Jews in Hollywood and frankly, and it, this isn't all that related, but I have some ethical questions about the content Hollywood produces. And I, if I'm talking to someone about that, they're probably going to be a secular Jewish guy. That's level two. That's just a fact. That's just a reality. That. That's, that's two. That's that's social science. Level three, if I say them Hebrews are making the movies to pollute our children, that's racism. So there are those three distinctions. There's comedy, there's fact, and then there's there's racial prejudice. And you can say this with every group. The black crime rate is 2.3 times the white crime rate. What that means in practice is 98% of blacks, 99% of whites aren't criminals. If I say like all black people are apes and murderers, then I'm a racist. So that's that's kind of how I would close that one down. But that doesn't mean you can't say the black population is younger, more urban. We're talking two point three to one. Well, but the question is whether you can how would how that joke will you spell it S T E A L? How that if if you're in a society where lots of people associate just overestimate how many black young men are engaged in crime it's tricky it's you know it's like black poverty you know liberals whenever they want to defend that something is not um uh, there's no personal responsibility of blacks for education for this or that they say it's poverty black poverty well how many black how many blacks are poor you know 20 percent mm -hmm. so so it, it's a you know if if you live in a world where a large number of people think that a plurality of young black men are criminal, you got to be careful. That's all. Right. Mm. All right. Well, I guess we will leave it there. I think we said a lot. We uh, learned a lot, and I hope we don't get canceled. And. Um, but I appreciate you. Um, he is Robert Cherry, author of Why the Jews, How Jewish Values Transform 20th Century American Pop Culture. Robert, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me and uh, have a great, great night. God bless the US of